1968, Apollo 8 went to the moon. They didn't land, but they did circle the moon. And I was watching it on television, and at a certain point, one of the astronauts casually said, we're gonna turn the camera around and show you the Earth. And he did. And that was the first time I had ever seen the planet hanging in space like that. And it was profound. Well, uh Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this broadcast of our Celestis Memorial Space Flight. Um, we have a very, very interesting evening for you. So uh, I like to preface this with a little bit of an introduction for a gentleman who we have online with us. Uh, using interviews with writings by 29 astronauts and cosmonauts, Frank White shows how experiences such as circling the Earth every 90 minutes and viewing it from the moon have profoundly affected our space travelers' perceptions of themselves, their world, and the future. He shows how the rest of us who have participated imaginatively in these great adventures have also been affected by psychologically by them. He provides a powerful rationale for space exploration and settlement, describing them as the inevitable next steps in the evolution of human society and human consciousness as the activities most likely to bring a new perspective to the problems of life on Earth. I'd like to introduce first off our um, grand guru, our CEO and great man, as we all know, Mr. Charles Chafer. As you know, he, uh, he runs Celeste. So I um, want to make everyone here aware also that if you have any questions during this entire program, uh, uh, broadcast, I'm sorry, Please make sure that you log in uh, on our comment page and go ahead and type in whatever you want. Um, but again, I'd like to say hello to Mr. Frank White. How are you, Mr. White? I'm great, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, this broadcast, before we go into our uh, formal heritage informational session, uh, it's going to be focusing on you for at least the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, hopefully you'll be getting questions from your audience. Uh, other than that, uh, your basis is on the overview effect. And uh, the over overview effect for a lot of people that don't understand can be better described by Frank, but I'm going to try and make a stab at it as, you know, a local human being here, as I can say, um, is basically an astronaut's reaction, okay, to itself and its environment after he is off this world viewing the earth. Is that close to what I'm getting at? Yeah, it's an experience that has been reported by astronauts and cosmonauts and it happens in orbit. It happens on the way to the moon, on the moon and returning. And it's a shift in self-awareness, a shift in worldview. It's a fundamental change. And if you think about it, Mark, None of us who are participating tonight, or probably very few of us have ever had that experience unless there are some astronauts watching. And if you think about it in detail, it stands to reason that actually leaving the planet and looking back at it in the context of the universe would be totally new information to the brain. And it would be surprising if something didn't happen, but it does and we call it the overview effect. Well, some people will relate a little bit to the all inspiring uh, overview effect. I'm sure that if I was ever in orbit, um, my reaction to seeing the Earth below us would probably be monumental. I wouldn't really know how to describe it. Um, let's go ahead and talk to our guru here. Charles, how are you doing? I'm doing great and want to welcome Frank and thank him very much for joining us on our monthly Celestis Live Facebook event. And I want to stretch the conversation a little bit to Frank's newest book called The Cosma Hypothesis, 
which takes as a beginning point, if I may uh, extrapolate the overview effect, but really as one of the leading guiding lights of the philosophy of why we humans explore space, it takes a step further and talks about the mutual interplay of human beings and the universe, meaning for those amateur physicists who never quite got past the fact that observing something changes it, um, we really have in Frank's latest book, the fact that humans not only try to understand the universe, but they, by doing that, affect the universe. And I find that A, fascinating, and B, would like Frank to talk a little bit about that hypothesis and then maybe link the two to what it is that, as he has come to understand Celestis and our Celestis people, how does that, how does the interplay there with those who witness a memorial space flight or choose a memorial space flight for themselves? Be very interested in hearing your thoughts on that, Frank. Sure. Well, the overview effect and the Cosmo hypothesis are definitely strongly linked. And we could start almost anywhere to talk about that link. But one place to start is when I was finishing writing the overview effect, right after the Challenger accident, I heard a TV program, saw a TV program this week with David Brinkley. And Tom Wolfe made a statement there, which was that our country had never had a philosophy of space exploration. And that just hit me like a bolt out of the blue. And I thought, well, we need a philosophy of space exploration. That's when I started calling myself a space philosopher. You know, nature abhors a vacuum and I saw one. So I jumped right in, but that was 1986. And ever since then, I've been trying to put that new philosophy into words. One element of it that is so clear to me from writing the overview effect was as a space advocate, and I know, Charlie, you and I have been space advocates forever. You know, for years and years, we, we explain the purpose of space exploration in what I call homocentric terms. It will help us in the following ways. And in some ways, the shift in consciousness that I described in the overview effect was really homocentric in a way. It will help us to see ourselves in a new way. And in writing the Cosmo Hypothesis, I asked myself, why actually, from a universal point of view, has evolution created a spacefaring species on planet Earth? What's the point? Not from human point of view, but from the universe's point of view. And that really changes everything. And the two things that happened in writing the book were, I went back to my original interviews with astronauts for the overview effect. And I realized, my goodness, I overlooked the fact they were talking about the universe, not just the earth. Because you see, you see the earth in the context of the universe, you see it from space, but in space. So I pulled out every time an astronaut said universe, I pulled it out and put it in the new book. And I began just asking myself the philosophical question, what can we possibly offer to the universe, which I began to call Cosma? What can we offer? And just to summarize it, I'm not sure this is right, and that's why I call it a hypothesis. But I said, well, maybe our purpose is to spread life, intelligence, and self-awareness more broadly through the universe. In other words, through us, the universe becomes more self-aware, more intelligent. And I'm not the first person to say this. Carl Sagan said, we are the way the cosmos comes to understand itself. So I've been building on others. And taking it back to Celestis, there are a couple of aspects here. One is, I got started on this topic through David Livingston the 
person who does the space show, and I know you're a sponsor. And after one of the shows, he said, you ought to talk to Charlie because I've been to these launches and it's not the overview effect in the sense that you see the earth from outer space, but it's that feeling of unity and oneness and togetherness that the astronauts describe that I have felt at launches. People from all these different places, uh, different backgrounds come together and we feel like we're one, we're all humans. So as you know, Charlie, I did an interview with you and several other people, including people who had been to the launches, and they said exactly that, that they had this feeling of connection and uh, fellowship with others. And it it isn't the overview effect in, in terms of seeing the earth from a distance, but it is in terms of the feelings. The other aspect, speaking to Cosma, I take note that rather than putting a loved one in the ground, which is connecting back to the earth, Celestis is putting a loved one out into the cosmos, which I think metaphorically states something that one of the astronauts said to me, Al Sacco Jr. said, People ask me why I risk my life to explore outer space. And I tell them the astronauts have a secret and they all know what it is. And the secret is we're not just citizens of a planet. We are all citizens of the universe. And, and in a way, metaphorically, I feel like the launches you're doing are pointing to that future citizenship. I have a question for you. Uh, sure. Mind, right? sure. Um, I, I understand that uh, you had mentioned that there is a connection, there is a closeness with um, the families that are in fact uh, sending their their relatives uh, to uh, beyond. People have always related a psychic connection with, let's say, a parent and a child. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a psychic connection with the same with a husband and a wife. Um, do you feel that somehow, psychically, and this may sound weird, and please forgive me for this, psychically that they are in fact feeling uh, that experience that their loved ones are then feeling uh, while traveling beyond our bounds? Is, is that a little screwy or am I a little crazy for thinking that way? Or, or is no, there I, I, think, I think there's truth to that. I mean, for certain, it's an interesting language um, characteristic to this, which is even though you and I, we all know that Celestis is launching remains and not even an enormous amount of remains of a loved one, the way people seem to talk about it is, you know, I sent my mother or I sent my child. It's like that entire person is going. And I also feel like there is a sense that they're going to. Uh, and then, you know, I've been to two shuttle launches and I feel like that's similar in that even though the astronauts are the ones who are physically lifting off, the crowds feel like they're going with them, that somehow humanity is, is lifting off. Um, it's hard to describe if you haven't experienced it. And that that's the whole point of the overview effect when we describe what the astronauts feel, it is an experience and it's hard to put into words. So I've been to multiple launches, 15 of our launches, and at every one, uh, and I've been to some launches that weren't mine, like, like you, I've been to shuttle launches and others. And the difference that I can describe is when I'm standing the requisite three to five mile safety corridor away from a rocket and it takes off, that, that's really cool. I mean, there's just no doubt about it that, that that's a peak experience. But I noticed that when somehow it's mine, meaning I have 
a loved one, and I've sent several friends to, on our missions, when there's some personal connectivity to that launch, it's a completely different feeling. You know, it's stronger, it's more apparent, it's different. And so a lot of our, I'm reviewing our most recent video of our launch last September and listening to the people talk before the mission and after the mission. And it's really pretty amazing to see the transformation of mm. I'm so happy dad is going to, I really didn't know what to expect, but this was an unbelievable experience. And mm -hmm. what we like to do with Celestis is categorize motivations for people to choose our, why do people go to the difficulty, A, of finding this, B, of deciding that we're worth a few hard-earned dollars of theirs, C, wait the requisite amount of time because so far you can't book a flight and go next week on Celestis. Why do people do all of that? And it's because they just know. And that may be the Cosma hypothesis in action. They know that this is what they were meant to do for their loved one, or they know that this is the experience that they wanted to uh, encounter as a result of that. And I, I often quote um, the wife of one of the participants on our first flight, the founder's flight. The participant was Benson Hamlin, who was the chief designer for the Bell X-1 aircraft that Chuck Yeager flew. And Bonnie Hamlin made an early decision, and this was back in 1997 when we first started flying. And she put it so magically, which was, I just walked outside on a starry night one night and looked up and said, that's where Ben belonged. And that feeling, that in, intuition almost, that, you know, I, I, to me, it almost feels like the DNA pulling at you. <laughs> um, is that interconnection and that interplay to the universe? And it is that overview effect in the sense that they know what they're, they're looking forward to what they're about to experience and when they experience it, uh, words, often fail them, but emotions come to the fore. The other interesting thing is just as we humans um, always encounter multiple kinds of emotions, in a celestial launch, uh, it's this amazing combination of grief and sadness and exhilaration and joy. Mm -hmm. What I tell people at our pre-launch briefings is that you will never, ever attend a funeral where there's this much high-fiving and cheering during the actual event as you do at a Celesta launch. And it's that transformation of grief into exhilaration that's at the core, I think, of what we do and why why what we do appeals to people is it's it's just fundamentally human, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, I uh, I've decided to be part of your advisory council, and I've also um, decided that I want to do this myself. And the main reason is obviously I won't be experiencing it, but it feels like a gift to my family now that I know what it'll be like for them. And I know that many people feel that way as they reach a certain age, which is, you know, how is my family gonna react to my passing? And this is a great, this is a great option, I think, because I, I can just see them all at a launch and uh, having a great time and also I've also read this on your website too. So many of us have wanted to fly in space for so long. Uh, you know, we're of a generation that watched Apollo and were inspired. And I think many of us said, I want to do that. And I think for the loved ones who are left behind, 
there's this excitement. I can finally give, you know, Frank or Charlie or, you know, Jerry, Jerry O'Neill or whoever it was, uh, I can finally give them that thing they wanted. And, you know, time ran out. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just a, fa it's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic kind of completion, I think. Can, can be very comforting. I'm reminded of the words of um, one of our clients' wife, uh, who basically said to me, you know, my husband didn't smile very much toward the end. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't laugh. He, he, the, the joy was missing in his life. Mm -hmm. But oh, the smile that he portrayed when I told him what we were going to do for his yeah. life journey. And being able to give that kind of comfort, both to the what we call our participants, when they know that they're going to fly, and to the family members, is so much a part of why we, the Celeste team, get so much value ourselves out of doing this, is that we just see that we're helping people. Uh, and as you say, it, it fulfills people's dreams. And in our way, if you will, long before space tourism, which is still today, even, a $25 million event, um, if you, can get a low price seat to go to the uh, International Space Station. We were all about democratizing uh, spaceflight. We were about making it available, albeit symbolically, but importantly symbolically, to really almost anyone that really wants to do it. Yeah. And I yeah, think Frank, that's, that's important. Yeah, go ahead, Frank, Mark. I have, a, I, have a, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, out of the uh, massive amounts of astronauts that you've spoken to, I do believe it's 29 plus, mm -hmm. uh, have, uh, based on what we do, okay, Celestis here, uh, have you ever heard them have a longing to return back to Earth in whatever form, or I'm sorry, return back to space in whatever form necessary? <coughs> we have actually launched and will be launching uh, astronauts both in the past and, and, and in the future. And I was wondering if after their experiences having that overview effect and then having to come right back down to earth, did they have a longing to go back? Was there a calling uh, to them to actually want to be back up there in any way whatsoever? Well, I haven't had anyone say they wanted to be back in a Celestis way. <laughs> but I didn't ask them that either. I mean, that wasn't really my focus, but yeah, you know, I've had astronauts tell me that it's addicting to be there. And we have to remember, it's not just the visual side, it's also weightlessness. And there are other aspects of the spaceflight experience. And they've also told me they were really surprised at how quickly they felt totally comfortable in that environment. Um, you know, Mae Jemison, whom I did not interview, but I've seen a famous statement by her. And it's kind of a backhanded compliment. She said, you know, before I flew, everybody said, you have to read the overview effect. And, uh, and I read it and I thought, yeah, after I came back, I thought, yeah, I did feel connected with the earth. But what really was important to me was how connected I felt to the universe. And I felt I just belonged there as much as any other entity did. Now, I'm totally mangling what she said, but that's the essence of it. And I believe that it's not as alien an environment out there as we think. Um, you know, I've said before, we shouldn't say we're going into space. We use that term too much. We are in space. That's where the Earth is. It can't be anywhere else. We have never been anywhere else but in space. So I try to get people to use a different term, which is leaving Earth. We're leaving Earth. Okay. Um, and you know, Mark, going back to your question, 
we're imagining a future of descendants who don't have any desire to come back to the earth. <laughs> and we don't know what that's going to look like. But one thing that interests me regarding Celestis is, as I've said before, everything we do on Earth will do in the solar system and beyond. And one of the things we'll have to do is somehow um, cope with dying. And what are the rituals going to be for those who have left without an intention of returning? Interesting. There's sort of much to think about. It. It, if I may, apropos of your question, Mark, uh, I can quote Susan Cooper, who is the um, wife of Gordon Cooper, who we flew actually tw three times uh, into space. And her statement to me was he wanted to go back as many times as he could. How could I not do a Celestis mission at the end of his life? Right, right. Uh, if I could interrupt, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, you could go ahead and type them in. Um, bear in mind that after our really fantastic uh, Frank White interview, which we really don't want to leave right now, uh, we will be giving you a briefing on the Heritage flight and anything else beyond that. Um, so please stay with us. I'm sure you will. I'm seeing some fantastic comments that are coming up on, on our screen right now. And I can't put them all up because we have Frank right now. So if you have any questions for Frank, why don't you go ahead and type it in right now and we'll put it up there on the screen and uh, see what kind of answers we get uh, from Frank. Hey, Frank, I have another one for you. Are okay. you a sci Are you a sci-fi fan? Yeah, I think, um, well, I wouldn't say that's exactly how I got started with interest in space exploration, but it was a big part. Right, okay. Uh, any genre, any favorite movie, any favorite character that you are interested in? 2001. There you go. Great and answer. The classic. The uh, classic. And for several reasons. One was it combined so much. It, it, it pr produced, it presented a realistic view of the future uh, in terms of space travel. It included contact with extraterrestrial intelligence, which is another interest of mine. But also another interest of mine is artificial intelligence and robotics. Hmm. And there was good old HAL 9000. Um, I remember walking out of that film thinking I had seen something profound, but I wasn't sure what. <laughs> and I think it's taken me a long time to figure it out. Wow, well, you must have been yeah. all of 15 years old when I came out, right? <laughs> I, I was a little older than that, but I also, I can't let it go by without mentioning Isaac Asimov. And uh, he was probably the first science fiction writer I read. And I had the great privilege of co-authoring two books with him later on in, uh, in my career. Interesting. And he's a great hero of mine. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Charlie, you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I just wanted to put in a plug for 2001 as being the motivator as well. I, uh, I think I was maybe 16 when that movie came <laughs> out. I went to see it, and it's really still the only movie I've ever seen where I sat in the seat after it ended for what seemed like an eternity, but was at least 20 minutes. <laughs> just trying to figure out Processing, what it yeah. And um, over the years, I probably have seen that movie, I don't want to say it, but it's certainly double, double digit times. And it was a strong motivator for a young non-scientist kid growing up in Oklahoma to decide then and there that, hey, I got to be a part of this. Yeah. And, um, it certainly influenced me as well. Well, um, I have to say, uh, you know, regardless of my uh, charm and my good looks, 
Um, I, in fact, saw 2001 A Space Odyssey in the theater as well. <laughs> uh, I, was I was young enough to be in a little bit more of awe uh, than some other individuals, whereas you guys are probably trying to calculate, um, you know, the whole movie. I was just boggled. I, yeah. I hadn't seen anything like that. It was just amazing. Arthur C. Clarke comes to mind when we talked 2001. Oh, yeah. It's another one of the great pioneers. And I have to say, more than one astronaut who I've interviewed, I said, how did you get started? Two common themes were Apollo 11, when I saw that landing, and mm. science fiction. Those were strong motivators for a lot of people who actually made it and became astronauts. Well, since it's our show, I'll uh, claim the right to tell only one Arthur C. Clarke story. Uh, besides noting that we have and will launch Sir Arthur's DNA uh, aboard Celestis missions, I, I met Sir Arthur at the Unispace 1982 conference in Vienna. And we were at a reception at the U.S. Embassy, and I saw him, obviously larger than life, in a sarong, surrounded by people. And I'm not a hero worshiper, but my boss at the time was Deke Slayton. We were getting ready to launch the first privately funded rocket into space later, two months after I met him. And so I swallowed my pride, got in line, and went up to shake Sir Arthur's hand and introduce myself. He wasn't Sir Arthur then. But, um, and he said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I, I work with Deke Slayton. And his eyes bulged hugely. And he said, Deke Slayton? So I had the best Deke Slayton story ever. Uh oh. Okay, so you have to hear it. So. He said that when we were filming 2001 in England, NASA sent Deke over as our technical support person. And um, anybody that knows Deke knows that this is a story that, that rings true. He said that Stanley Kubrick took Deke on a location tour and, and uh, was proud of all that they were doing and finally brought him over to meet Arthur Clarke and um, he said, well, Clark said, well, what do you think? And Clark says to me at this meeting, he said, he looked right at Stanley Kubrick, Kubrick and said, Stanley, you've been conned by a used capsule salesman. <laughs> <laughs> so... That's the interplay of science reality and science fiction, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been fantastic that uh, we are, in fact, um, launching Sir Arthur Clarke's DNA, at least into orbit. And like I've said before, if, if you guys would visit uh, our Celestis Facebook page and our Celestis, of course, our Celestis website, um, you can probably see some past launches and people that were aboard our past launches. Um, we have had astronauts. We are launching um, movie stars and movie producers uh, up in space. Um, but Frank, I have uh, another question to ask you. I don't see any questions in the comment. If anyone has any questions, we'll probably be uh, closing this out shortly so that we can go right into our informational uh, part of the show. Um, but I guess, Frank, I'd like to read something that I, I pulled out of your book. Uh, in fact, let me let me goes solo on the screen. If you guys have not seen this, I would suggest uh, that you purchase this book, The Cosmo Hypothesis. And uh, of course, it is written by Frank. And uh, read it. It is a good read. Uh, honestly, I could not get through it all um, because, you know, I, I work for a living. Uh, but Frank, I just wanted to ask you on this one passage that you wrote here. Um, you said, and you probably already said it, uh, mention it, but I'm sorry about this. The Cosmo Hypothesis suggests that our purpose in exploring space should transcend focusing on how it will benefit humanity. We should ask how to create a symbiotic relationship with the universe, giving back as much as we take and spreading life 
intelligence, and self-awareness throughout the solar system and beyond. Frank, how do we do that without all of the profit mongering that's going on out there now with, um, you know, uh, pay for a flight out into space as a living being, but not necessarily coming back with much to share other than stories. How do we do that with ourselves? Well, that's why we need a new philosophy of space exploration. I think the first change is just a change in awareness, <clears throat> a change in how we think. And I believe that the other key word is balance. I don't believe humanity is going to spread out into the solar system and the galaxy without exploiting what they find, what we find to some extent. What I'm calling for is a balance between exploration and exploitation. Um, in the great era of exploration that we're all familiar with in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, uh, it was fantastic in some ways from a European point of view, you know, in the sense of discovering new worlds and new ideas and creating new forms of government. But there was a lot of exploitation of the environment and of other people. So what are we going to do? We have to think differently and we have to think of ourselves as part of a larger interconnected environment. Just to close, one of the things that gives me hope along those lines is that for centuries, we've looked at the earth as this resource rich area that we could exploit without any negative outcomes. And now largely because we've seen the earth from a distance, we are beginning to change our philosophy. We're saying we have to have a balance with our planet. People talk about saving the planet. All of us are old enough to know and remember when nobody was talking about saving the planet, why do we need to save the planet? You know, this is new ideas. So I believe that if we want to be supported in exploring the solar system and beyond, we're going to need to find that balance. And I think that on the negative side, if we don't find that balance, we're not going to be supported by the universe to do it. Let me speak as um, a resident of Houston, Texas, which for the last week has had our tank farm on fire, yeah. spreading a cloud of dark smoke and benzene over the um, environment, having closed the famous ship channel due to pollution. <coughs> um, that balance is that need for a balance is here today. It's here on Earth. And we go back, Frank mentioned Jerry O'Neill, the person who gave me my first job in the space field and the person to whom really reignited um, uh, my youthful interest in space. Jerry had a way of speaking succinctly as a physicist would saying that our choice going forward is um, organize scarcity or create wealth. And it struck me as I was sitting in my economics classes at Georgetown, studying the models of doom and limits to growth, that the only chance that the gener my generation and the generations after me have in my view, has been to create growth. The way that we organize scarcity on planet Earth um, is usually associated with weapons, but is often associated with have and have not. And Jerry was so good about pointing out that 100 miles up, we have unlimited everything, sunlight, minerals, vacuum within which to do pollution-free production. And 
in my studies, it always looked to me like coming to the new world, it wasn't the wealthy people who came to America, but it was the downtrodden, the lowest of the low, some of whom came in voluntarily, I might add, but that the chance for our civilization uh, going forward was to create wealth and it was quite likely that it might not be the wealthy haves who do that. It might be the people that need the release or the opportunity to go out and take the risks associated with wealth creation. And to me, I added the fact that as far as we know, there were no Native Americans that we had to kill off in order to do that a hundred miles up. And so that sort of concept that goes back to Jerry O'Neill and others before him, but he really popularized and, and succinctly stated it, has been the driving force of my life. And it connects to Celestis. The people that choose Celestis are funding the new rockets that are necessary to escape to Earth. And they're taking the individual steps by being on board our missions that are opening up that frontier. And I'm perfectly comfortable with that wealth creation. We got some work to do about distribution and all of those things. But it's so much better than, you know, trying to have infinite growth in a finite system that just by definition isn't going to work. And I think that reflects a lot of, I won't put any words or thoughts in Frank's mind, but I know the space geeks and the space people that, that I work with are, have a strong motivation to try to do some of that. Yeah, and I think, you know, a closing thought on my side uh, Charlie, I think that I can say without fear of contradiction, no astronaut I've talked to has suggested we should leave the Earth behind. They have a better appreciation of the Earth than they did when they went out and left it briefly. And I think this growth into the solar system has to be a uh, process that includes Mother Earth and um, and her well-being. So, Frank, thank you so much for taking time during your dinner hour uh, to join us and give us the the philosophical backbone, if you will, for uh, what we're trying to accomplish in our own small way at Celeste, and hopefully opening to the folks that see this live and the many thousands of more that will tune in to our YouTube channel and view it in the days and weeks to come, giving a sense of the, um, of the awesomeness of what we're all trying to do as we not only go out and move into space or move off Earth, <laughs> I try to create a philosophy that allows us to do that as human beings. So we really appreciate you joining us this evening. I know you have a, another engagement, so we'll, we've held you a little longer than we promised, but I, I had a ball. <laughs> I enjoyed the discussion a lot. It's been fun, and if I didn't have something else to do and you didn't have something else to do, I'd stick around. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. and. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you later. We'll talk soon. Yeah, we will. Goodbye, everybody. And Mark, you're on mute. <laughs> yes, I was on mute. <laughs> um, all right, folks, uh, that was Frank White. Uh, make sure you go out and you purchase his book. His latest book is on Amazon for Kindle uh, or paperback at the, uh, the address that we have posted here, the Overview Effect. We thank uh, Frank so much for being here. Uh, those of you that are still here in attendance uh, with us at this moment, uh, of course, we will be getting right into our broadcast on the Heritage Flight. I know a lot of you guys are, are mentioning um, the Heritage Flight and who you have on board. I will be putting those up on the screen um, shortly. Uh, but in the meantime, for those of you that do not know, uh, Charles Chafer is our, 
our, our Lord and Savior here. He is the guru um, responsible for providing us with all of these wonderful adventures that obviously no one else has ever thought of except him, I would assume. Um, but we have done uh, about 16 launches, I think, Charles. Coming up on our 16th. We've Coming done up on our 16th so far. Right. And if you have not experienced, if you guys are joining us for the first time or if you guys are returning to us uh, for this heritage informational uh, piece right here, uh, please listen up. There is some very, very important information that Charles would like to pass on to you folks. If you have any deep down questions that you need to be answered right now and today, well, this is the, the spot to do it. Go ahead and type in your questions. Um, but this won't be the only place that you can ask questions. You can go to our Facebook page. You can go on our website or you can actually call us personally and we'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have um, about this upcoming flight, the Heritage flight. Um, so without any further ado, I'll go ahead and pass this over to Charles. I'll be asking him a few questions as well and I'll be putting questions from the audience up on the screen uh, so he can handle those too. Charles, it's all yours. Thanks, Mark. And let me go off topic to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say first that, um, and this is kind of weird because if you're seeing this, you're on Facebook, but if you have, we, we know we have a lot of uh, clients and people who are interested in what we're doing who choose not to be on the Facebook platform, but really want to see what we do here. And we always post the event that you've just seen on a non-Facebook platform. Tomorrow it will be on YouTube. And all you have to do is go to the Celestis channel on YouTube, click on the uh, presentation tonight, and you can watch the whole thing without having surrendered your soul to Facebook <laughs> if, if you're concerned about that. So that so tell your friends, I think, is the important point there. Second thing I want to say is that today we received and reviewed the uh, final copy of the family video for our most recent launch, the Starseeker flight, which uh -huh. was accomplished in September of last year. And, you know, a little bit of pride here. I think it's our best video yet. And you'll be able to log on and view that three-day event on our YouTube channel tomorrow as well. And if you're a Star Seeker family member who just happens to be watching tonight, you'll be getting an email from us that gives you the precise link on the YouTube so that you'll have the first chance to view the family video, which again, we do for all of our missions and we're, you know, we're getting pretty good at it. Um, and uh, I think you'll enjoy seeing the Star Seeker flight. So now I will uh, talk about what, what Mark mentioned, which is giving you an update on our next Earth orbit mission which we've called the Heritage Flight. I think most of you are aware that the plan is to launch that mission on the General Atomics OTB, that stands for Orbital Test Bed Satellite, um, out of Cape Canaveral, Launch Pad 39A, which is a, a very famous launch pad, launched a lot of the Apollo missions, launched a lot of the shuttle missions, and aboard a Falcon Heavy rocket. So we'll have, I believe we have 157 participants on board that mission. So we're expecting quite a few folks to want to come and be part of that, those, that three-day mission activities. What I can tell you is the following. Um, and let me note that we only transmit um, 
launch information that we receive directly from our provider, General Atomics. And that's because they've got the satellite on the rocket and they know more than anybody else. So um, you may see in the coming weeks, especially a fair amount of speculation or people that know about something before we announce it, which is great. Um, if you want my opinion, it's listen to us because we verify launch dates as best we can through our service provider. So that's the um, uh, overview. The launch is currently scheduled for May 31. Um, and I say the term currently scheduled because I expect that that is still a target date, meaning don't buy any tickets, don't make any hotel reservations, don't do anything but check our website or your email, particularly if you're a family member, um, we'll let you know when and if that moves, but I'm speculating that there's probably a minimum. Let me describe what's happening. So we are sitting there waiting for the next Falcon Heavy launch, which will fly Arabsat into Earth orbit. I believe it's currently scheduled for April 7th. That's what my ticket says. But my ticket also says that's just a target date and don't, <laughs> don't make any reservations. So if it occurs when it's currently scheduled for April 7th, then we're likely in a 60-day minimum count from that point, which would put us at June 7th. The reason I say that is I believe the plan is to land and recycle components of the Arabsat launcher and that that is targeted to be a 60-day turnaround. Whole lot of things got to go right for that to happen. But, uh, you know, they're, they're doing a great job down at the Cape, getting missions off, getting boosters back, and flying like it's a routine operation these days. So, as I said, at our last gathering, for the first time, we got a no later than date from uh, General Atomics, uh, and that no later than date is currently the end of June. So it's beginning to look a lot like we're going to have a June launch. Watch very carefully the Arabsat launch, as I said, currently scheduled for April 7th. If all goes well and everything is recovered, then our next marker point is likely to be the date that the OTB satellite is shipped from the factory in Denver, Colorado, to the launch site in Florida. I've been told by the General Atomics folks that that will be approximately 45 days before launch. They've told me that when that shipment occurs, they will let me know. And again, if you're a family member, you'll get an email from us if you're the primary contact uh, that tells you when that uh, satellite has left. It's at that point that things get pretty serious. And by that, I mean, we solidify the following items. The first is we'll name our headquarters hotel. I have a pretty good idea of what it will be, but we won't release that until we're ready. But I can tell you it will be in Cocoa Beach and that again, we'll release that information as soon as we know for sure that there's a date and that the um, satellite is shipped. We'll also announce the three-day itinerary, the specifics. And that will basically be at T minus two. You arrive and you register with us and there'll be a reception at the hotel 
that you're invited to sort of a mix and match meet and greet. I honestly don't know how many people will attend. If I had to guesstimate, I'd say around 200 guests. It could go to 300. It could go down to about 15 if the thing, for whatever reason, gets postponed and postponed. But my guess is there'll be around 200 folks from around the world, all of whom have loved ones on the Heritage flight. So we'll announce day T minus two, which we call day one, which is registration and reception. T minus one, which is day two, we encourage people to go to the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center, separate admission required. But when you do that, you'll have the best chance to view the launch pad and likely the vehicle on the launch pad that morning or in a position uh, of about to be on the launch pad. But it's a great opportunity to um, see uh, all that the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Centers offers. Then that afternoon, again, T minus one will be our memorial service. Again, I have a pretty good idea of where it's going to be, probably the same place as the last time we flew out of Florida, which was actually in downtown Old Coco, but we have not set that yet, and therefore we won't make that announcement. We'll make all of these announcements simultaneously. We're not trying to, you know, to stretch out the, the uh, mystery or anything like that. We just know that no one really books anything or tells us we can book anything until there's an actual launch date, which there isn't yet. Then that evening we'll have a hosted dinner with some special guests, typically at least an astronaut, a former director of the Kennedy Space Center, and most certainly a guest from General Atomics to tell you about the OTB satellite. OTB is one of many satellites that will be on that launch. Another that's particularly interesting to me is the Planetary Society's Light Sail, I believe it's Light Sail 2, which is a solar sail mission, which will fly on the same rocket that we're on. And that will be um, the dinner the night before. Then on T0, you go to the launch again, you'll have some options on going to the launch. We do not control access to the venue known as the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center. Um, for the next Falcon Heavy, they're offering three viewing locations and they range in price from $75 to $195, the higher price one being as close as you can possibly get which I know a lot of our folks are going to want. And again, when those tickets go on sale, you all will be the first to know, and we will attempt to aggregate demand and make that happen for you. But if you're of limited means and it really stretches your budget to just get there, there are, I don't know, maybe a hundred places around the Kennedy Space Center from the beach at Cocoa Beach to up north to other locations where people get a great, one of the things about the rocket is, yeah, I want to be as close as I can and that lasts for about four seconds. And, and then everybody gets the same view going up. We will be publishing a list of locations that are free, not easy, but free. Um, if you just if you decide that you want to go, but you don't want to uh, purchase the ticket, I should mention that the ticket that you buy will be a two day ticket, which allows you to go on the day after the launch to the Kennedy Space Center, and that there is a scrub policy, meaning if they don't fly the first try, you get a second chance to to view it. All of this information will be on our registration page. The registration page will be launching tomorrow, I believe, but we're only opening the 
pre-registration portion of that page because as you hear from me, we have not, we cannot nail down the final arrangements yet. And we won't be able to do that until after ArabSat flies. But as soon as it flies, we'll unveil the entire registration page. But if you are a family member or a primary contact, you will receive an email from us again, likely tomorrow, certainly sometime this week, that directs you to go to the pre-registration page. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of information on the pre-registration page, but you also help us a bunch by letting us know I'm coming, I'm not coming, I'm coming and I'm going to have three people with me. We do these events around the world and this will be our 16th time, so we're pretty good at it, but we try to get as much information from you as we can, including do you have special needs? Are there things that we need to know about the visitors who are coming to be a part of this mission? We have a great team that will work very closely with you to make sure that you have the experience that you're hoping to have by attending the launch. But you can help us out a lot by going to our pre-registration page. And again, we'll send you an email with that link tomorrow so that you can be among the first to tell us about what your intent is vis-a-vis -vis vis visiting us for the Heritage Flight launch. Now, as always, we know that not all of you can attend the Heritage Flight three-day activities. So we make an effort to webcast as much of those activities as we can. Certainly at a minimum, a full webcast of the memorial service, probably including what we call the pre-launch briefing. And then there'll be several webcasts of the launch. It's a big deal. It's the largest rocket currently operating in the United States. We will not be alone in attending this launch. Unlike perhaps some of our launches in New Mexico where most of the crowd there is ours. In this case, most of the crowd at Kennedy Space Center will not be us, but we'll make it, it will make you feel special if you do attend. And if you don't attend, we'll put as much of it live on the website, webcast as we can. And of course, we always have photographers and videographers who capture that. Some of the photos you're seeing in the background with Mark, the Family videos, we call them, are all posted on the Celestis YouTube page. So you can see what it will look like, what your family video will look like at the end. And we go, I think, to as great a lengths as is humanly possible to make sure that you can experience as much of the launch as possible. Of course, after the launch, will be real-time tracking OTB, possibly for as long as 25 years uh, while it's in orbit, and you'll be able to see the orbit on our website, um, uh, just as you're able to see uh, now there are two of our orbital missions that are still remaining in orbit, and you can see where those are. We still have family members who attended those launches who log on, figure out when the satellite's going overhead and step out on a starry night and, and uh, have some uh, recollections of their launch experience. Hey, but, Jeremy. So I think we'll stop at this point. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, speaking of such, I do have a question in relation to what it is you just mentioned. So if you could look at the screen there for a minute. Says uh, one other question. Well, we'll get back to his previous one, but he said, uh, do we know if the launch will occur at night or during the daytime? We do not. Um, it's a good question. My suspicion is that it will be a daytime launch. And the reason I say that is the night launches are usually the launches that have really tiny windows that have to catch up to the International Space Station and they optimize the orbit and the orbit dictates the time of day of launch. 
mostly the range likes to operate during the day. And this launch being an Air Force launch with a variety of satellites, none of which am I aware, but I don't know all of them because I imagine maybe a few of them might even be things I can't know. Um, but I don't believe any of them have a precise orbital parameter. So my semi, my informed speculation is that it will be a daytime launch, but we do not know that yet. And when we do, of course, we'll let everybody know. Excellent. Uh, previous question to this gentleman. Um, for those of us attending the launch, will we be able to see the Falcon Heavy's boosters land back at the Kennedy Space Center? Um, I believe the plan, I don't know, again, they've not announced what they're going to do. Remember, these will be used boosters that they're flying, if you will, on our flight. And they may elect not to try to recover them. Uh, if they do, we'll see it they're, they're, because they'll bring two of them back to land right there at Kennedy Space Center. But that, as far as I know, has not been announced yet. Okay, there were some questions at the beginning of our broadcast that we couldn't take right away. Uh, let's just pop these one. Let's see. Let's see. My my husband is going on a heritage flight May thirty first. Hopefully, uh, congratulations, Martha. Um, we'll, hopefully, we'll be able to see you. And Mary Ellen Jones also said my husband is also on a heritage flight. Um, welcome, Mary. Welcome to the family. And I'm just panning up here. Uh, Cindy, whoops, Cindy says, my mother, Modine Johnson, is on the Heritage flight. Um, that's fantastic. Bear with me as I go through, because I'm going through the beginning of the show. Here's Sharon Sievers saying, my sister Diane is on the Heritage Memorial flight. Um, it's great to have all of you with us tonight. And uh, we will do an April update. I'm trying to decide whether it will be the 15th or the 22nd. My guess is it's likely to be the 22nd. I need to coordinate that with my team here, but we'll, by then, we'll know more. <laughs> okay. uh, here, here's something we can have a little fun with from Jackie. Jackie says, my husband is going to do this to me. Hey, Jackie, uh, how about you take your time? <laughs> no rush, no hurry. Uh, stay with us as long as you possibly can. And, um, We'll see you later. Let's see. Uh, Cindy it, says it prompts me to uh, <laughs> to to let everybody know that we do have what's called a pre-arrangement option. Ah. And should you choose to go ahead and make that pre-arrangement now, several good things happen. <laughs> the first is, you know, it's going to happen, uh, and um, you you get the not only the personal peace of mind, but you reduce the burden on your relatives at what might otherwise be a difficult time to go ahead and pre-plan this. Secondly is you lock in the price. And our uh, we do a really good job of not raising prices very often, but the longer you live, the less likely you are to have the same price as you do today. And finally, I think the coolest thing is, as Mark has mentioned, when you uh, elect to prearrange, and by the way, the, the, the prearrangement places the majority of your money in a trust account that is not released until we buy the rocket or provide the service, until we do the integration. So you have the comfort of knowing that, that, that it's there. But once you've joined us, you become part of the Celestis family and you get invited to all of our launches. We also do tours of, we, we did an amazing tour of the factory that built the orbital test bed satellite. We had 75 folks show up for that in Denver and uh, meet the engineering team, see how enthusiastic they were about hosting the Celestis payload. So you get to be part of everything that we do. So that's a minor sales pitch on prearrangement. Well, that's great. Cindy says, I know my sweet mother will be smiling from the heavens at the launch of the Heritage flight. 
She traveled so much while she was alive and loved every minute of it. She will be taking her final flight on the Heritage flight. Welcome, Cindy. Welcome to the family. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if you guys have questions, please go ahead and post them now. I'm going through all of the uh, older messages here, trying to find some of these were already answered. Jackie had asked, uh, where do you take off from? And of course, uh, Cape Canaveral was already answered by somebody else. Uh, da, 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 bear with me. Um, oh, here's another good one. Uh, what is the primary payload for the rocket launching the Heritage flight? That's an excellent question. I'd like to know that m myself. Who else will be joining us? Uh, not in the same respect, but in terms of uh, occupying the space on that rocket. I'm not sure who the largest spacecraft is. The last time I looked, there were 25 satellites on. Wow. Again, this is a rocket that was purchased by the Air Force, and it's called the Space Test Program, part of the Air Force. And this mission is actually, if you look it up, you won't see it under Heritage Flight, except on our website. It's called STP-2. So there are, as I mentioned, there'll be several Air Force payloads on board. I mentioned the Planetary Society Solar Sail on board. The OTB satellite itself has experiments from NASA, an atomic clock. It has some commercial experiments on it. And it, it itself is a little mini uh, housing of multiple experiments. So in reality, and it's a good thing, I'll, I'll, I will look it up to see what the largest satellite is. But this is unlike a lot of missions where there's a very clear primary satellite. In this case, the primary customer is the Air Force, and they're making space available for a lot of their own missions, some NASA missions, some private sector missions, and some mix thereof. So we'll have a comprehensive listing uh, to post soon and to, to answer that question. But as I said, the last time I checked, I, there are over 20 satellites on this mission. Excellent. Uh, you're going to have to help me with this one, Rich. Uh, I'm sorry, Charles. Um, this young lady says, my mother and father-in-law is on the, and that's where I lose it, the, the I'm hoping she's talking about our heritage flight because I don't really understand that word. De Carouville. Does that sound familiar, Charles? Am I mispronouncing that? Say it again. Uh, let me see. Decarugal, De Carouville, De Carouville. I'm not sure. I think there might have been a. The, the, it's the. De, I can't pronounce their name. I know them very well. De, de Carouffles, and I believe you met them mark at the star seeker and they're on the heritage flight oh okay so all right so that's their name yes yeah care oh okay i'm sorry yeah. i should have read her name right there so darian yeah they're wow. they're they're a great family um i met actually the folks that are on this flight at one of our earlier missions where they flew i believe their mother so we're we have a multi, I believe we have a multi-generational uh, family supporting us there. Right, and, and for, that, for those that are watching us or haven't joined us on any flights before, as you can see, uh, people return to go on future flights. Uh, this family, I, I think I do remember them. Um, I'm not sure which, which family member they send up. Did you say it was their mother? Charlie? Well, on a distant flight, yes. Oh, oh, I see, so. Um, past distant. But coming forward then, then they're sending again their mother and father-in-law on right. this flight. So that's yeah. fantastic. Well, welcome back, guys. Uh, can't wait to see you guys. Uh, once again, yes, I see that's her last name, Kathy said. I got it now. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. We also mentioned that there are at least 25 satellites headed to space on this mission, as Charles had pointed out. Uh, we are the secondary payload alongside several Air Force payloads, experiments from NASA and commercial providers. Etc. This is a very unique launch, so we're going to have a lot of people there. Um, I would even to... classify us as a tertiary payload because oh, what is that? A secondary payload on a secondary payload. Oh. I'm not sure how that how that <laughs> genesis works, but in this instance, we're on a satellite that I know is not the primary satellite. So, 
But we, we, we love the folks at General Atomics. They have really, really been great uh, to work with, very supportive, and uh, we're happy to be on OTB and happy to get this thing near to flight. It's been a longer wait than we had hoped, yeah. but, you know, um, that's the rocket biz. And, uh, and I understand that people want to see their loved ones, get their loved ones uh, up in, in, in orbit as promised. Uh, but, you know, you may not want to hear this, and I'm sorry to really say it, but it is worth the wait. It is a, a, a fantastic, unbelievable, once-in-a-lifetime experience. And, and Charles, what's the largest payload that we've, uh, how many of our participants have you shot? I think remote? we had about 330. Wow. On a that? Falcon 9 launch, which was the commercial resupply number one out of Florida in um, 2012. Wow. So I think that's the most folks that we've flown um, in at one time. Wow. Had to be a huge memorial service, too. It was big. Yeah. Yes, that's that's big. Uh, I don't see any more questions. If anybody has anything else they'd like to ask, this is the time to do it before we close out this broadcast. Uh, I'm still going through. I really don't see anything. Uh, okay, here's a space geek question. Um, with 25 satellites on board, is that a record for a launch? Hmm. Uh, no, it's not. I believe the uh, there have been uh, Russian satellite or Russian rockets that have had more than that. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot. I'll, I'll put it that way. It's not normally you see one, two big ones, and then maybe up to ten little ones. Um, so this is this is a large. This is not a standard mission uh, set at all. It's a large number of satellites to be launched. Okay. All righty. Uh, I guess if that's all the questions, if nobody else is popping up with anything else, uh, please remember that you can. Um, oh, let me get me on the screen. There you go. Please remember that you can ask any question at any time. Uh, don't think that this is the only opportunity that you're going to have to get any of your questions answered. Uh, we will answer them twice, three times if we have to, as many times as you feel comfortable with. Uh, you can do that through Facebook. You could do that through our uh, website. You could call our offices in Houston. I'm in Orlando, um, by the way, for those of you guys that, that did not know where we're broadcasting from. Charles right now is in Houston. I am in Orlando, and, and, and my claim to fame is that I can, in fact, and have walked outside my door for every space launch coming from the Cape. I can see every space launch that goes up. Uh, the shuttle launches were the best, in my opinion, but um, um, I'm just happy to be a part of this team uh, and uh, to get to know more people. I've met a, a lot of friends from our previous launches and memorial services. Uh, everybody's just been absolutely fantastic. It's one, one big family when we're all together. And uh, it's, it's the memorial service, even though we don't, we have to, we're, we're using the word memorial. Uh, it's a celebration. We're, we're all together, um, just basically getting to reminisce about our loved ones and and talk about how much they meant to us. And you guys are basically introducing me to people that you have uh, sent up into space. And we really, really uh, like to know that. So once again, please go to our Facebook page, ask any question you have. We're getting close, guys. Uh, please understand that we are at the beck and call of the space agencies and their schedules. If they're not comfortable with firing off a rocket or if they're not comfortable with the launch date, they will reschedule. So has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with their safety uh, and their property. So please um, bear with us as we are getting closer and closer as this is solidifying even more. Uh, and you guys should be getting even more excited uh, about this because once this happens, it's it's going to be it's going to be an unbelievable experience. Charlie, you have anything to finalize? Well, it's a good point, and just that we will ramp our communication with our family members uh, as we get nearer to the launch. We'll probably do weekly um, conference calls that people can phone into and get updates. And of course, we always communicate via email. So that that's the other thing is, please be sure that we have your most current email address 
if you're a uh, if you're the primary contact for your loved one flying uh, just this past week i think we got six folks who said well we haven't heard from you since november and they had all changed their email addresses and so of course they didn't get anything when we sent something in march or in uh, other times so be sure that your information your contact information is current with us and you always know that we post any launch information first and foremost on the heritage page at celestis.com so if you have any doubts just go there and it whatever date is there is our most current information on the launch but as mark said we welcome you calling us or sending us emails or whatever we're, we're here to try to help you do what you've been looking forward to doing uh i'm gonna slide in this last question charles it kind of segues into our um flight after our launches after this one uh it, it's 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 a valid question so i'm going to go ahead and let you handle it and it basically says on your memorial flight to the moon next year are you actually going to put the capsules of cremated remains on the surface of the moon that's yeah for the second time i should say uh yeah the uh, second time right so we won't act well let me let me be precise we are not releasing the capsules onto the surface of the moon. We are flying on a lander that will land on the surface of the moon or, um, uh, and not, if you will, the plan is not to release them. Now there's always a chance that the uh, spacecraft will get into lunar orbit, not execute its landing correctly, and then it's an impactor, as you say, but the loved ones will then be on the surface of the moon. But our intent is always to land gently and remain there literally forever. Okay, so great, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, when it comes to that, we'll be having uh, regular updates like we are having right now in terms of those future missions. So uh, stay tuned, but don't wait to book. Okay, if this is an interest of, of yours or any family member, uh, please spread the word around to all of your friends, loved ones, whoever, that this is a possibility for them, that this actually exists and that they may wanna look more into what it is that we do and go ahead and become a part of what it is we do. Um, if you have all the money at once that you wanna throw at us, fine, okay? But uh, if you wanna go, come on some sort of payment plan, uh, to plan for any future launches, please go ahead and check all of our information on our Celestis Facebook pages and our websites and call the office, whatever you need to get more explanation uh, for everything that we here at Celestis do. And Richard, you are very, 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 very welcome. He says, thanks for all the information, Mr. Chafer. So uh, we thank you. Um, so as for myself, Mark B. Lee and Charles Chafer, our leader, um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and hopefully we will see you next month sometime, preferably, I'm assuming it will be April 22nd, Charles. Yeah, that'll be the, that's the plan going forward, yeah. Okay, we'll do that, and that's the next time that we'll be able to hold another briefing and inform you guys of what's going on for Heritage, which will be super close uh, at that time. Um, so thank you guys once again. We appreciate it so much. And um, we will be signing off now and we'll be talking to you real soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate it. After I came back and tried to understand what this experience was all about, I could find nothing in the science literature about it and nothing in the religious literature that I looked at. So I, I turned to the local university and asked them to help me with what I saw. And when they came back to me a few weeks later and said, well, in the ancient literature, we found a description called Salvacapa Samadhi. And they said, that means that you see things as you see them with your eyes, but you experience them emotionally and viscerally as with ecstasy and a sense of total unity and oneness. 
And I said, well, that's exactly what the experience was. And so it's rather clear to me as I study this, it wasn't anything new, but was something that was very important to the way we humans were put together.